Good evening. Uh, we'll call a meeting to order. According to that clock, it's 6.02, and according to that one, it's 5.58. Uh, my name is Ralph Anderson. I'm the chair for this evening. Uh, first thing, please, if you could turn your cell phones off, it would be appreciated. Uh, there are hearing procedure sheets on the end here for anybody that didn't get one. They're certainly welcome to grab one. Uh, this evening, the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board of the Municipal District of Bighorn Number 8 will hear an appeal filed on July 11th, 2022 regarding the appeal on a Notice of Decision for the Development Permit Application Number 20-22 for the development of an open an outdoor community rink, recreation facility, and shed accessory building on the MD of Bighorn property on lot six, block one, plan one 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 three six one eight in the Haviland of Dead Man's Flats. Uh, my name is Ralph Anderson. I will be chairing the hearing this evening. I ask that all questions and comments be directed through me. Um, and I'd ask the fellow members of my board to introduce themselves. I'll start on my right. My name is Marina Craner. Uh, my name is Eric Butters. Uh, <clears throat> I live in the Ghost River area off Highway 40 in the east part of the MD. And again, my name is Ralph Anderson, and I'm a 20 plus year resident of Exshaw. Uh, is there any objections from anybody here tonight uh, with the members of the board sitting for this hearing? Okay, I will now ask the secretary to outline uh, the case of the appeal here, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you have noted, the appeal before the board tonight is an appeal filed on June 14th, 2022, regarding the appeal of a notice of decision for development permit application number 2022 for the development of an outdoor community rink and shed on MD property located in the Hamlet Dead Man's Flats. The notice of decision for development permit 2022 was issued by the development officer on June 15th, 2022. The appeal is dated July 11th, 2022, and is being made by the appellant. The notice of the appeal was sent to adjacent property owners and published in the July 21st edition of the Rocky Mountain Outlook. Under Section 687 of the Smith Government Act, in determining an appeal, the SDAB must comply with the land use policies and statutory plans and the land use file in effect. However, the SDAB may make an order or decision or issue or confirm the issue of a development permit even though the proposed development does not comply with the land use bylaw, if, in the board's opinion, the proposed development would not unduly interfere with the amenities of the neighborhood or materially interfere with or affect the use, enjoyment, or value of neighboring parcels of land, and the proposed development conforms with the use prescribed for the land use or building in the land use bylaw. I'll refer you to the screen. This is the subject property located in Dead Man's Flats. This is an aerial view. As you can see, subject property is located here. This is Rivers Bend Close coming along this direction here, and there's a cul-de-sac. The access to the property is actually along here, which is an MR trail, which goes here and then loops around the uh, subdivision. But this is clear access that goes into where the location of the shed as well as the rink are located. And this parcel right here is where the previous rink has been there for the last four or five years, and that is a PUL lot or a storm pond. This is a close-up view. This came from the development permit application. So you can see the rink location of the rink. There's the shed. Again, a closer view of the cul-de-sac, the storm pond, as well as the access coming through here, which can get to the property. This is a schematic of the rink that's proposed to be constructed. This is a picture of the shed, side view, as well as the, uh, the uh, front view where the uh, Zamboni or tractor with attachment will be located for the property. The property is uh, in the public service district, and the uses of the, uh, the multi-use rink is deemed to be a recreation facility, and the shed is an accessory building both are discretionary uses within the public service district. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I would now ask that the appellants uh, please speak in favor of their appeal. 
Uh, could you introduce yourselves too, please, before you start? Thing. Right. Okay, uh, my name is Robert Templeton. I'm a retired Scottish dairy farmer. Um, I was president of the Kilmarnock branch of the National Farmers Union for two years. It was an industry that was worth £50 million to the Scottish, to the Scottish economy, and uh, that would be equivalent to $80 million Canadian. I had the opportunity to speak before the Rural Affairs Committee in the Scottish Parliament. In my spare time, I'm a chess player. I was four times Ayrshire Chess Champion, which is 250,000 people, but not all of them are chess players. My other hobby is writing in newspapers. My partner, Karen Riley, is an experienced mountaineer, hiker, and an ice one-time ice climber. Um, she had... Her, she used to be... a a team leader for Red Deer, and she would bring people down to the mountains here, and she's got a rock tower in her house with over 100 summits, with a rock from 100 summits. Um, our, probably our, mis, our most uh, well-known feat was being part of a British-Canadian team that climbed Aconcagua in South America in 2009, and she was one of the two women that made it to the top. But... Uh, She's passionate about the ice, about wildlife, and she persuaded me to go to hike up Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa in 2019. And we went on safari and saw animals in Tanzania and Zimbabwe. So that's the background of where we are, we are coming from. We're really passionate about the wildlife. Um, my big complaint about this is that there's a professional report stating that the wildlife corridor should be protected, dating back to 2004 on the MD Bighorn website. It can be found under Planning Services, Concept Plans, Rivers Bend Limestone Valley Conceptual Scheme. It was prepared by Golder and Associates, Alberta Environment, and an independent biologist. It clearly stated that there should be a 180-metre setback from the Bow River to give the wildlife space. In 2015, Golden Associates stated that no lights from the industrial area should shine onto the wildlife corridor. Now, I know that this plan for the skating rink was approved on June the 15th, but on June the 14th, the Reeve was appointed to the Bow Valley Human Wildlife Coexistence Roundtable. Now, what does coexistence mean to you? To me, to me, it means an equal opportunity for an equal opportunity for both the wildlife and the humans. Well, at the moment, the humans have 400 metres, I would say, and the wildlife is 180. And this skating rink is going to be straight in the, in the wildlife cor corridor. Given that funds are coming from the province, was Alberta Environment consulted, even if they are, a, you know, should they have been consulted? Uh, could you, you know, well, yes, if you could, please. Yeah. Now, the top picture there was one that I took on the 7th of July, and it shows four people out measuring the ground, bearing in mind that the, the, the message of the presentation in the paper was the 23rd of June. So that was 14 days after into the 21 days, there was four men out there measuring, measuring up the, the area. And then, could you turn? Again, on the 9th of July, the top photograph there, I had to go down and chase away 
a downer's truck and a downer's skid steer. So that was 16 days into the 21-day the appeal period. Um, they did say that they would go, they consulted their boss and they said they would, they would leave, and they did leave. But to me, it just showed a disregard for, for the due process. Um, the next point I would like to make is the fire risk. The application should have been the subject of a comprehensive fire risk assessment due to the partying aspect and the use of a fire pit in the old rink area. Last year there was a grass fire in Dead Man's Flat. It showed how quickly the fire could spread. It was allegedly started by a cigarette. One of the consequences of the fire was that the Fire committee had to use bolt cutters to break in and access the fire hoses. Could you open that, Cam? Um, the fire hoses from Gerald's end of our joint shed. The proposed shed in the skating rink needs to have a way of gaining access to those fire hoses because I would assume that that's where they would be kept. The Zamboni will need fuel and/or propane cylinders. Open it up, if you can. Where the um, where is this going to be securely stored? How is the fuel going to be taken to shed, bearing in mind that the only access point is the one used in the illegal attempt to start construction without proper authority from an MD Bighorn and is not suitable for emergency vehicle access? This is in part due to a street light. Oh, Excuse me, I just... I will go back, I've just missed a bit here. Um, the wildlife, which is what I'm basing my whole presentation on. This is uh, an male elk, beautiful set of antlers, standing right in the position of where the ice rink's going to be. Could you just flick the next page? The top one, which again was taken from our hot tub, and it shows a grainy picture of what we think are bears going along the berm. Uh -huh. The bottom one, again, is female elk. Again, in the same area as where the rink area is going to be. Can you just flick again? Again, an elk walking along the berm. It has been noticed. One of the things that we have noticed is during COVID, there was a lot of kids were riding their bikes through the through the, the trees, as you'd expect, because they weren't allowed to go anywhere else. But this year, it's been quite noticeable because the kids are not riding through the trees. There are few. There are actually more wildlife coming through the area. This is here. It's maybe hard to make out, but there was two coyotes running up our back yard here. So just to give you a broader idea, just flick on it. Two geese, maybe not the biggest thing, but just to give you an idea that there is this area is widely used, and I know my partner Karen, she had a video which she had to take very quickly because there was an elk this year on the actual uh, grassy area, and a bear came over the berm, and she had a picture of the elk rushing away very quickly, and the bear, the bear appeared, and there was a notice in the, one of the area that people weren't to get in there because there was a bear in the area and we, I saw bear scat myself because my favourite my favorite photograph, if you ever wanted to see why don't we build a rink in this area, there is this one phot photographer who does bring wedding couples to this area to get their photographs taken against the backdrop of the trees in Grotto Mountain. And that, to me, tells you, you know, do you appreciate beauty in the, in the Rocky Mountains? I know you probably say, well, we've got so much beauty here, we're spoiled for choice. But it does give you an impression that, you know, this is a, a beautiful area. This here is to do with the fire risk. Now, this is the only way 
that they can get into, into their proposed rink. Now you see those three rocks there. They're actually, they're actually three rocks. Those three rocks are you could you move to the next slide? Those three rocks are usually placed between the, the light standard there and Gerald's fence. Now they're usually there, but they haven't been there since this whole thing started. This the bottom picture there shows you the path. Now it looks narrow in that path in that photograph, and it really is narrow. That sign that says well, all the prohibited signs. Well, I can put my hands out like that, like that and I'm within a meter between that sign and that bush. So that is how wide that track is. It's simply not suitable for either ambulances, first aiders, or fire engines. It really is not suitable. In the winter time, because of its north-south location, it melts in the summer. It melts during the day and freezes at night. And the only way you can actually walk up and down there safely is with spikes. It really does uh, it is a particular danger. Um, the top picture gives you an idea of the incline from the proposed drink area, and it's about two meters. And during the time that uh, Downer, the lorry had struggled to come up that incline, and that's in good weather. And I think for them to construct this rink, they're going to have to build a road. Are they going to take the road away once the construction's passed? Or are they going to leave it there? And as you well know, this is a floodplain, and I know that the MD will have a picture of where the actual floodplain is. Is this going to whole rink area going to collect debris? Because remember, if MD was looking at um, that tragedy in Kentucky, the amount of debris, and I mean it would be debris would be coming down from Canmore, is going to back up against something. And then that's something that's going to be broad enough because the, the whole area in there has been fire smarted. There's really nothing to stop debris coming in through the trees. And it could easily pile up against this rink. That's again one of the the, the risks that I have, have highlighted. And then there's the, pass, the parting aspect to the rink area. Is it, it is inevitable that smoking and drinking happen. It's human nature. In the late summer fall, the weeds are, near, are knee high and represent a genuine fire hazard. The fire service needs to be consulted to ensure that fire trucks can enter the narrow lane, can they even turn in. Now that's... That's a pretty basic concern. It's either that the light standard has to be shifted or there has to be a proper road made somewhere else. Can you just flick on? Now, I'm going to come to... This is probably one that you have seen before. It is a basic layout of the Dead Man's Flats housing. Could you move to the next one? Now, there... It gives you an idea of where the wildlife fence is going to be. This is the only, the only picture that I have of the wildlife fence. And this fence is supposed to run, and I'll maybe just get up to show you. This is the line of the wildlife fence. It's from here all the way up along there. Could you go to the next? Along here, along here and then along here. That is, that is where they're, prepared, they're proposing to put the skating rink. Now, at the moment, I know there's a big fight over where the fence is going to be, but this is the only line of fencing that is in any plan. Again, it doesn't make sense to allow this to go until there is a clear idea where this wildlife fence is going to be. Um, another, high, another point I would like to emphasise, and I didn't make it in my original thing, was the proposed rink is going to be built in old sewage ponds. As a farmer, I was used to having to do soil sampling 
before ever pulling fertilizer. And my research into sewage settling ponds is that they harbour heavy metal pollution, mainly lead, cadmium, zinc and others. I just feel this whole application is rush, 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 and there should be at least a basic attempt to see if there is any dangerous contaminants in the area that could be aerosol when they start working to move soil as they intend to do. Um, I wonder if you could go back to... Back. Just keep going back and I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> right, stop there. Now, there's a, a risk to children walking in the dark. And bearing in mind that this rink is going to be maybe 30, 40 metres in from that particular street, that particular street light, well, that light is the only light between that cul-de-sac and where the proposed rink is. Now, you're going to have children walking home in the dark, and I feel there needs to be a remote monitoring system with cameras at each end of the rink so that when the lights are shut off at 11 p.m., no child is left in the dark. This would allow children sufficient time to exit the rink safely and also shut off the lights remotely to save electricity if the rink is not in use. Motion sensors should be an option so that it's not just left lying there with lights blazing in the wildlife corridor. And I feel, you know, quite strongly, you know, just yesterday there was a report of a cougar attack in a seven-year-old in Rocky Mountain House. Sadly, this adds emphasis to my comments on child safety. I mean, it might be a one in a million opportunity, but if it happens in dead man's flats, it's a one in a hundred opportunity. And I just feel that this has not been really thought through. There needs to be some way of having access to this rink that is properly lit, and there needs to be an adult there to make sure that the children are able to exit that area safely. Because during the winter time, people who are walking dogs, they all have their headlamps on because it is dark behind there. There is no natural light. Now, could you move back forward again? Oh, just, just back one. That car at the bottom there, as you can see, is sitting straight across from the opening into where the access to the rink would be. It's maybe not very, you would have to probably see it on my iPad, but in here, there is actually, you can see a mound of snow sitting on the top of a rock. It's placed there. So that gives you an idea that it would be difficult to access that as the way things stand at the moment. Could you go forward again? Just keep going. Thanks. Now, I have to say that I'm not against a skating rink in principle, only its location. Can the skate, the skate rink be placed in a more suitable spot? Dead Man Flats already has a de designated playground area, clearly badged. The only problem is there's nothing there. The grass is cut there, and there is clearly water and power available. It could be easily utilised. Karen and I looked at the, Har the Harvey Heights skate rink. And that is the Harvey Heights. You'll notice that the one thing that I noticed was the height of the lighting standards. They're probably about four metres high, which is fair enough. You know, it's not too, the rink's not too big, and it looks well looked after. Um, do you move on? We then looked, we took a very much closer look at one in Canmore, which was full size with dimensions similar to the DMF proposed rink. What was noticeable was the height of the light towers. The light towers there are eight metres high. What's that going to do to the light? You know, well, even if they're shining down in the rink, that is going to be a considerable uh, impact. And we had a chat with the homeowner that was nearest to that rink, and we asked him, we said, what's the problems you have here? And he said, car parking in the street. 
They said it was eventually resolved because they built a car parking area. And then I said, well, is the sound of the pucks hitting the side of the rink? Is that a problem? He said, no. He said the real problem was the ghetto blasters and the loud music coming at 11 o'clock at night. And he said, because of that, there is a 10, 10 o'clock curfew. And nobody's allowed to be on the rink after 10 o'clock at night. And I thought that was, that was really, you know, should be a consideration. The top picture is the one in Dead Man's Flats. As you can see, give the, the guys their due, they constructed a well a well constructed rink, but it's the amount the amount of time it's actually in use. In twenty twenty one it was only there for two months. And this photograph it starts usually around the around about Christmas time is when they can get skatable ice. And this year this was what was taken on the 14th of March. As you can see, it's, it's derelict. Nobody's looking after it. So the skating rink is only going to really be in use for two, two months, and I don't think that that really um, is sufficient to, to disrupt the area. And there wasn't even enough snow this year for a cross-country ski trail, which is usually put in in the neighbourhood. Going forward, there's a lack of winter justify building a rink because we all know about global warming and I think it's, it has to be said it's here to stay and it is going to have um, a continued effect. And then in the, the, the skating rink plan 2022, adequate parking spaces were indicated along Limestone Road with 16 spaces available. Well, it's coincidental. I didn't know that Downer was going to arrive and uh, the Saturday the 9th of July but that morning I went out at half past seven in the morning and I took this photograph and I count eight cars there there's one that has obviously moved and there's another there are actually two spaces further down so there was actually 11 cars parked there uh, during the summer at the now, just now because there is building work going on in that area it's quite common to find that during the day that area is completely full In, my old, in our experience, garbage has always been a problem. I couldn't resist highlighting the garbage and the lack of tidying up. This is not a very good photograph of the old rink area in the storm pond. There has been absolutely no attempt to scatter the ashes or remove any of move them. You can also see up in this corner here the remains of an old skating are an old uh, goaltender for, for the rink, and it's been lying there for the last six months, and it'll probably be still there in 10 years. Now, what I want to show here, and this is a, a, I want you to look at this word up here, legend. Now, it's, it doesn't mean anything, but it's just what's there. Next one. An illegal, an illegal fire pit. As you can see, there's a hockey stick. There's also a garbage can. And this here is a picture of the garbage can, which doesn't have a bear-proof lid, as you can see. And that's in, in, the area, in that particular area. Now, the MPC did consider the question of a bond to ensure that all MD policies were followed. The skating rink was approved by the MPC and notice of approval was dated 23rd June 22. It gave anybody wishing to appeal the approval 21 days to object to the approval. I feel my rights to appeal the decision were violated by the appearance of the truck and skid steer load on rink site on Saturday July the 9th. I had to quickly go down and appraise the operatives that had no authority to be begin the expert the excavations. After a while, they moved away. <sighs> I would bring to the attention of the committee that the existing bylaw states that no motorised vehicles are permitted in the area. The vehicles had to pass a notice to this effect. This is a clear breach of MD Bighorn bylaw, with the, base, the blatant disregard of MPC rules. 
a bond should be applied and only refund, return if there are no more infringements. It has become clear to me during my attempt to stop the illegal con commencement of construction of the proposed skating rink that the empty, as I said earlier, the downer truck had great difficulty getting up with this 45 degree slope. Um, this will not be suitable for concrete trucks. It will requi require construction of a proper roadway. In, in conjunction with the need for emergency access, there needs to be a report on how such access would hinder the flow of water if the Bow River ever was to flood. And then again, I just added the drop in the value of the houses close to the rink. We had a realtor in and they said, well, that's 100,000 to 200,000 down the down this, this, the Swanee, as it were, we'd lose. Uh -huh. It said that the drop in value of our houses close to the rink, we had a realtor give us an assessment that there is a potential drop in value of our house between one hundred to two hundred thousand dollars if this development goes ahead. In conclusion, in all my years of being associated for planning for or against the applications, I cannot recall any that had so many flaws. The first and foremost is a wildlife co corridor. There's no point in the MD saying, oh, this is now a, a recreation area. The animals don't understand that. Child safety should be paramount. It can be guaranteed in this location. Fire safety and unhindered access to the site is not possible at, at present. Noise and light pollution needs to be considered in what is our living space. In the absence of any other plan, the wildlife fence has to be considered as per the concept plan. Building in the floodplain is going to cause an obstruction to the free flow of water. If we ever get an atmospheric river like what they got in BC, then we could be in trouble in Dead Man's Flats and we really don't want any obstructions that would stop the free flow of water across that area. Soil contamination should be investigated to find out if there are any contaminants that could be released into the air during construction. My final observation is that due to the presence of hordes of mosquitoes this, that we have this year, no one is going to be running around in shorts and bare arms down in that area. It's only summer use might be as an expensive off-leash dog park. And I think that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much for hearing us. Uh, do you have any questions? No. No. Do you have any questions? Here? Okay. Thank you. Um, I will now ask if there is anybody here. Uh, where are we here? Is there anyone else here who wishes to speak in support of the appeal? And uh, Mr. Secretary, is there any other correspondence received in support of the appeal? Yes, there was one email that I received. Is that in our package? I believe it is. Thank you. Do we have any MD of Bighorn advisors that wish to speak this evening? Uh, no, we do not. Okay. Your Honor. I didn't think I was the mayor. Uh, then I would ask that the MPC or development officer speak in support of their decision. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can, Brittany. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to share my screen as well, um, and I can to share just a couple of slides. So let me just do that. Can everyone see? I believe so. Okay, 
Wonderful. Okay, so I was the development officer on the file. My name is Brittany Shuchek, and I'm a consultant working on behalf of the MD of Bighorn. Um, I'll just go quickly through um, some of my presentation notes, and I can speak to some of the technical aspects of the presentation or of the sorry, decision and why the, why the um, notice of decision was issued for this proposal. Um, so the subject site is contained within the Dead Man's Flats Area Structure Plan, which was an uh, area structure plan adopted in 2015 by the MD of Bighorn. As you can see here, this red area at the top is considered the North ASP area, and the proposed site for the rink is located about here. Um, the subject site is also uh, located adjacent to the Rivers Bend Limestone Valley Conceptual Scheme. The subject site is here of the conceptual scheme and the proposed drink development is about here. And this conceptual scheme adopted by the MD in 2010. So the subject site will be accessed by a series of ways. Um, and the intent uh, as per the applicant was for the site, the rink to be accessed by foot, similarly to the former seasonal community rink that existed on the Southern site, which is lot five here. So in terms of parking, under the land use bylaw recreational facilities, which is what the rink was considered, uh, do not have a minimum parking or loading requirement under section 3.15 table one. The applicant was asked to provide a parking and access plan um, and which indicated the pathway connections from the rink to on-street parking if required by the rink's users. So the applicant provided this plan here. Um, pathway connections to the proposed rink area are located in blue, so there's a number of them. And then Appropriate on-street parking, again, if required by the rink's users, was identified to be located on Rivers Bend Gate here in green. And the applicant also noted that Limestone Valley Road along here could also be used for on-street parking to access the rink if required. Um, the applicant also had noted that parking is not provided for similar outdoor rinks in Exshaw and the Bow Valley. In addition, policy 3.15.2D of the land use bylaw reads, where parking requirements of a development are not specified in the bylaw, like in this case, the development authority shall be guided by the standards for similar uses. So thus MPC in June was able to determine whether they believed on-site parking was required for the site, and it was determined by MPC that it was not required. In terms of operation of the rink, the applicant had noted that the rink will not be available for rental and it is intended for community members only. Um, as noted by Robert in our previous presentation, the rink lights will remain on until 11 p.m. There will be a light over the door of the shed and the surface of the rink will also be lit. lit. Regarding location, the subject site, again, as I had noted earlier, is within the North ASP area of the Dead Man's Flats Area Structure Plan, again adopted in 2015 by the MD. The subject uh, site for the rink is located within an area that has been identified for potential future recreation, which is outlined in this green dotted line here. So there are, uh, there's an objective within this ASP that relates and supports the rink development. The objective is to create recreational facilities that meet the recreational needs of the MD uh, residents and minimize impacts to the natural environment. There are two policies also uh, within the ASP that relate to this proposed development. Policy 7.2.6, which notes uh, to encourage active and passive recreational opportunities for both residents and visitors of the MD. And Policy 7.2.8 notes public washroom facilities shall be provided adjacent to any potential sports field or playground. So uh, during the development, so for the development officer's report that was drafted for MPC in June, um, I included the opinion that this proposal supported policy 7.2.6. Again, I believe that this rink does encourage active and passive rec opportunities for residents and visitors in the MD. 
And then as per seven policy 7.2.8, the public washroom policy it was in my opinion that because the rink again is only a small portion of the entire build out of this proposed recreational area, as per this area structure plan, a washroom facility would not be necessary at this time. I can speak towards some of the appellant's concerns. Is that through the chair? Should I, shall I go ahead and do that or should we? No, if you could, it would save us some questions later possibly. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the first concern that Robert had noted was the dif disregard for the wildlife corridor. Um, and he had noted that there was a 180 meter setback from the bow river uh, ident identified to give wildlife space. Now this wildlife corridor was noted in the River Bend, Rivers Bend and Limestone Valley conceptual scheme. So on page seven of this document, um, noted under development boundary, so the key factors in establishing this plan boundary, which is highlighted in yellow here, include, include the establishment of a wildlife corridor to the east of the plan area, 180 meter setback requirement from the Bow River to the north, and then a 30 meter setback from Pigeon Creek. Page three of the conceptual scheme also notes that the lands to the north is identified as a river back riverbank setback zone and then the lands to the east are considered the wildlife corridor and natural area. The conceptual scheme does not specify that the 180 meter Bow River setback is for a wildlife corridor. The conceptual scheme also does not specify specifically prohibit certain development types to be precluded from the setback area. It simply states that this setback area was used to form the boundaries of the conceptual scheme area. Again, a little bit, I uh, have found another document. Um, this was a memorandum issued by Golder Associates dated August 6, 2004, regarding the Limestone Valley Development Proposal. And this memo was called a reassessment of wildlife issues. So here I've highlighted a key part that relates to this 180 meter setback. And it reads, the strip of land along the north side of the proposed development is not a designated wildlife movement corridor, primary or otherwise. It is a portion of the Bow Flat Regional Habitat patch and as such does not have any width requirements associated with it. The current iteration of the Limestone Valley Development Plan indicates the strip of land between the development of the Bow River is 180 meters, a width acceptable to Alberta environment west of the proposed development and immediately north of the existing hamlet footprint, the undeveloped strip terminates in the existing camping area. The next, one of the next appellant's concerns was in, in regards to fire risk. Um, the appellant noted that there should have been a su subject of a comprehensive fire risk assessment. Um, the notice of decision that was sent to the applicant on June 15th includes two fire mitigation conditions. I'll read those out loud. I don't have them in my presentation. Condition 20 was unencumbered emergency vehicle access to the site shall be provided at all times during construction. And condition 21, the developer should consider using fire smart construction materials for the exterior of the building and in particular should use a roofing material with the class A or B underwriters labor laboratories of Canada fire rating ULC. Um, the appellant's concerns as well as the notice of decision were circulated to the MD's fire chief for review. It was confirmed that he was comfortable that the appropriate fire safety information was contained within the notice of decision dated June 15, 2022. In regards to the wildlife fence, the appellant had noted, um, he, he had said in his letter that there is a long-standing understanding that a wildlife fence be built around the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats. Both the conceptual scheme document as well as the area structure plan discuss this wildlife fence. Um, the, the area structure plan notes a few policies concerning the wildlife fence. Um, Policy 7.1.5 notes that fencing in the north and east ASP areas shall be 
designed to exclude wildlife from the development area. So here's the north area, again, here's the east area. Um, policy 7.1.6 includes details of the wildlife inclusion fence. And policy 7.1.7a notes human pedestrian access points through the fence along the north ASP area will be accommodated by pedestrian gates designed to allow human access but prevent wildlife access. So again, uh, just with this, the intent is for a wildlife fence to be developed around this recreational area in the future. It was my understanding that the MD will be dealing with this issue, but we're waiting for a land swap to com be completed between the MD and the province. And I'm not sure if um, Peter might have additional details that he would need to speak to if, if required here. But we can, I'll keep going through my presentation. Um, the appellant noted that there is risk to children walking in the dark, um, like any other park in the playground in the MD. Um, it's at the discretion of the parents to let their children play unsupervised. Um, the, the rink and shed will be adequately lit, but I don't believe that the MD currently monitors any other parks or playgrounds within the district with cameras and I don't believe it is their intent to do so. Um, again for parking the appellant noted that there's parking concerns. Again I had said earlier in my presentation um, there is a policy in the land you land use bylaw that notes where parking requirements of a development are not specified in the bylaw the development sh authority shall be guided by similar by the standards for similar uses, MPC determined back in June that on-site parking would not be required for this development proposal. In terms of garbage, um, the community association will be responsible for providing their own solid waste collection and disposal. This is a condition that this was a condition in the notice of decision that was issued after the MPC meeting. The MD and the community association are currently in the process of finalizing a caretaker's agreement and that would outline waste pickup and frequency and f details in regards to maintenance. And that, that, I think I've covered most of the appellant's concerns. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, I actually had one question uh, regarding access to the site for fire and uh, garbage collection and how is that going to work out? Uh, it doesn't, I haven't seen anything yet that shows me where the garbage trucks getting in or where the fire trucks are getting in. I'm wondering if you have any information on that. I don't have any information of that offhand. I believe that's something that's being worked out in the caretakers agreement through MD operations. Um, but I'm not, I can't speak to how the uh, existing temporary seasonal rink on the su Southern lot, lot five was accessed for garbage collection. I don't know if Peter, you can provide any further details on that, but I would assume that it would be in a similar manner. Thanks, Brittany. Can you show on the map exactly what this uh, lot location is? I don't have the lot numbers oh, yes. memorized. So this would be the location of the temporary rink that is no will be no longer in use, and this is kind of the new site, and the rink would just be near this uh, southern lot line. Yes, but you asked me about garbage collection location. Yes. Oh. Yes, and I and I the, the site is accessed. I'm I'm not sure how garbage will be picked up um, by the community association. How the site will be maintained? I would assume it's in a similar way, just because these the temporary seasonal rink and this new proposed site are very close. Um, but I'm just not sure how that was done currently. Thanks, Brittany. I understand the question now. Uh, to answer an earlier question, the little black rectangle on that map that you see answers your question about mm -hmm. the length. Sorry, Peter, was that directed at me? Oh, uh, no, sorry, that was for the oh. uh, operator. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. She will attempt, but 
I'm not oh. sure that PowerPoint. Yeah, I, I was asking on the PowerPoint, the detail area and the, where the, the black lines are that Peter's referring to, if we can expand that and be able to see it a little better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that little black rectangle represents the, uh, the laneway. And that would be the uh, vehicular access point for emergency vehicles and construction vehicles. Um, there, where you see the cul-de-sac in the in the lot ten, and there's a to the right of that, there's a sort of no lots. There's a right of way there. That's where there are public garbage cans at the present time. Um, I we're informed by operations that they are very heavily used present time and can't handle additional capacity. So it would be, uh, as in the conditions, the responsibility of the community association to remove garbage after events. And I guess my question is, is there going to be a, a municipal style garbage container that the trucks would empty on that site? Or does anybody in the room know? No, there would not. So the, the, there's no, the, the MD wouldn't be picking up the garbage from the site with the conventional trucks that come through town here? We don't have the capacity this year, and we'd have to look at expanding capacity in future years. Um, Brittany, can you read the condition relating to garbage collection? I think it's condition 19. Sure, yeah, let me just pull it up here. Okay, uh, condition 19, that's lighting. There is, let me just. Okay, so it's condition number 17. It reads, the Dead Man's Flats Community Association is responsible for providing their own solid waste collection and disposal unless, um, unless approved otherwise by the MD in writing. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Eric or Maria, do you have any other questions? Um, I am wondering whether you looked at the provincial flood map and compared that to the site of the development. Yes, we have... Um, I didn't look at the provincial flood, flood map, but in the Dead Man's Flats area structure plan, uh, with this plan included a constraints map. I'll just share my screen once again. So here's the flood hazard area, and you can see that in the shaded two blue colors, there's the floodway, and then you have the flood fringe and overland flow. And these, this site of the proposed development is not uh, within those two flood hazard areas. Uh, just as a follow-up question, so that is part of the 2015 ASP, so before the update of the flood mapping by the province? Uh, this was 2015, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we'll move along. Um, is there anyone else in the room who wishes to speak in support of the development officer's presentation? And anybody from Dead Men's Flats, if you want to speak, now's the time. This thing on? Through the chair, I just checked the flood hazard portal online with the province of Alberta, and it's it very similar to the identical, the flood hazard. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll pull it up in a minute here. 
If you could introduce yourselves, gentlemen, before you start, that'd be appreciated. My name is Doug, or Christopher Long. And I'm the Dead Man's Flats Community Association president. My name is Shane Jonker, and I'm a member of the uh, Rink Committee for the uh, Dead Man's Flats Community Association. I guess before we begin, I just wanted to see if you guys had received um, the 120 petitions that we had um, signed all across um, the Dead Men's Flats. Uh, we had, I think, six or eight people walk around door to door asking if anyone wanted to sign a petition, excuse me, a petition uh, in support of the rink and also in support of the location of the rink. Uh, I don't believe we had anyone not willing to sign it, but we also did have many people who were not uh, home to be able to assign. We ended up with 120 um, signatures, and then we also ended up with, I think, 23 or 25 emails in support, including uh, pictures from children and things like that. So hopefully you received all those things. We do indeed have all that. OK, awesome. Thank you. And uh, there was just a couple of things that, that I picked up uh, during the appellants presentation that I just wanted to cover um, that weren't in my presentation because I hadn't anticipated that. Um, besides being on the rink committee, I also participated in the development of uh, Rivers Bend and Limestone Valley. And um, as you are well aware, the site um, was previously, oh, that's not up there yet, um, a sewage lagoon site, and it was fenced, fenced off from, uh, from the wildlife. But uh, when we reclaimed that uh, lagoon, just in terms of the soil quality, um, that soil was deemed to be a, what's called a tier one soil, which means you can grow your carrots in it. There is, there is absolutely no contaminants. It was very, very thoroughly tested before the province gave us the okay, um, and the MD has all, all those records. So if that was a concern, that, that was, uh, that was handled during the development. Um, the fire pit photographs that you saw in the appellant's presentation, those uh, photos were not at the site, just to be clear. Those uh, photos are of a, a fire pit site that are actually along the, the Bow River Trail. Um, so just to make sure that there's some clarity there, that was uh, the beer cans and stuff were not part of the, uh, the rink site. And, the global warming comment, I think it's uh, important for everyone to know that the development that's proposed is a, a four-season development. There's, there's meant to be courts, basketball courts, pickleball, um, uh, we got tennis, ball hockey. So, so it'll be a year-round facility. So we don't need to worry too much about the, uh, the limitations of the, of the ice time, but we're hopeful that we'll have lots of that too. And on the access, uh, we'll leave that one. Okay, so um, what we wanted to do is just to sort of address all of the appellant's concerns. So what you'll see here is the appellant's concern and then our response to that concern. And I'll just sort of read through that with you folks. And uh, you guys can stop me anytime that you have a question about what, we're, what we've said. So the concern around the uh, wildlife corridor, um, I, I don't think it's been clearly enough stated, but there is no wildlife corridor. So that's just a uh, sort of a misuse of terms, but it's very important because wildlife corridors are <clears throat> designed and dedicated for the movement of wildlife. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the lands that are surrounding the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats are considered the Bow Flats uh, wildlife habitat patch. So the report referred to uh, provides recommendations that formed part of the conceptual uh, scheme that was approved. And it's important to note that the setback recommendations, uh, that 180 meters, was, a, was about where do we set back a residential and uh, industrial development. It wasn't about a recreational development. So it's really important that when you look at that Golder report from 2004, the decision about that setback was around where do we draw the line for intensive use, both residential and the uh, 
um, the industrial are considered intensive uses. And so, so that 180 meters applies to that development, and it doesn't apply to the hamlet. It only applies to the concept scheme for Rivers Bend, excuse me, in Limestone Valley. Uh, the proposed rink falls into the ARP area um, that uh, you saw a picture of, and you'll see another picture of it right away. I think if we scroll down. Uh, yeah, maybe one more. Yeah, okay. So this is the updated um, ARP map from Golder 2015. It's the latest. And if you, you can't really see it on here, but it'll be included f uh, for you. The, the orange dashed line shows where the proposed fence is going to be, and it actually goes around this recreational area. It doesn't fall, as was stated by the appellants, along the back line here. So that's, it's really important that that, that is addressed because it kind of negates the, the, the whole issue around the wildlife fence. The wildlife fence w is anticipated to include that area in the development area so that it can be used for recreation. The appellant said that the uh, 2015 update Golder and Associates stated no lights from the industrial area should shine into the wildlife corridor. Again, it's not a wildlife corridor, but um, the concern is addressed by the condition that was set out in the uh, decision, this, uh, which was condition 19. Careful attention shall be paid to the exterior lighting in order to preserve the night environment through reduction of light pollution. Exterior lighting shall be designed, located, and arranged to be low glare in nature and to minimize light trespass on adjacent properties. Light fixtures with a lumen output of greater than 2,000 lumens shall be fully shielded to the satisfaction of the MD. And, and it's the dark skies principle, which is the MD's um, lighting principle, for not just for sensitive areas like this, but, but everywhere. And we have our lighting expert. Mr. Master Electrician Brent Roosevelt here, if anyone has any questions on the lighting, uh, he assures me it will be pointing down only. So the appellant's presentation said, where there are professional independent reports, these should only be overturned by another professional report. And so I think it's important that when we're talking about this wildlife corridor, it's identified in the, in the Golder Report uh, updated for 2015 for the ARP that it is not a wildlife corridor and that the um, fence is proposed to go around the proposed recreation area. And I just uh, have a, a map, if we could back up the other way, yeah, so it's, it doesn't look nearly as good here as it does on my Mac, but uh, Dead Man's Flats, are we able to zoom that in at all? All right, well, this little green area right here is, am I right there? There we go, all right, okay, now we can see. So area three here, this is the, uh, the habitat patch. This right down at the very, very bottom of your screen here is the uh, sort of the currently developed area of Dead Man's Flats. And, and the, the reason I'm showing you this is just to show that the yellow areas are wildlife corridor, and this is a uh, habitat patch. So there's no wildlife corridor. Fire risk, it has been talked about. Um, I did hear some questions though from, from the board on, uh, on access. And I think we heard from the MD that, uh, that it was vetted by the fire chief and, and the fire chief and their protocols uh, are satisfied with uh, the location and the access. Sorry, can I just interrupt for a second there? Of course. Um, there was a mention earlier about cutting a lock to access fire hose in a shed. I got it. Is this shed meant to hold no. fire hose? No. So I'll just, I might as well just read what I've written here because I definitely covered off on all that. Um, in conjunction with the government of Alberta and FireSmart, the MD of Bighorn undertook a fuel, redu fuel reduction project on all the lands within the hamlet um, and the surrounding development. Incidentally, the FireSmart fuel reduction guidelines around urban wildland 
interface deal with tree type, diameter, health, and proximity. All of the homes on Rivers Bend close uh, on the north side or on the edge of this interface. These homes all have garages with vehicles and likely contain lawnmowers and other gas-powered tools, fuel cans, paint, and so forth. The shed that has been approved for the storage of equipment related to the recreational facility is an unoccupied building. No fuel storage tanks have been applied for in the development per permit and none are planned. The referenced hoses were stored for the purpose of flooding the rink. They were not fire hoses. They do attach to fire hydrants, but that is uh, because you know rinks are often flooded using a fire hydrant. Uh, they are by no means considered part of the uh, MD firefighting arsenal. These belong to the community association for the purpose of the rinks. And so what happened during that grass fire that happened in Canmore across the highway, um, the, it, it, was a, it, it was a moment in time when the residents uh, wanted to sort of be proactive and take some action. And yes, the uh, Gerald was out of town. Uh, he's our Zamboni man, by the way. And uh, he had the hoses in his shed. And so the lock was cut in order to prepare for, for the worst. Uh, but I can't, you know, the, to, to link that as, as sort of our community firefighting strategy, that's, that's, that's just nonsense. We don't have a, a firefighting committee in uh, Dead Man's Flats. We have a fire and safety committee and their role is education. So we, we don't have some like vigilante group that is, uh, that is looking after that stuff for us. Um, the proposed development falls under the MD of Bighorn bylaws and policies as they relate to fire pits. And the criteria for fire pits can be found in uh, Bighorn Living, as well as, uh, and I've got the links there that you will be provided with, and uh, uh, the MD of Bighorn Wildfire Mitigation Strategy document. So an example from that document is fires must be contained within a ring of brick, cinder block, concrete, or other non-combustible material of a minimum of 30 centimeters in height. Fire pits must be surrounded by a non-combustible buffer zone with a minimum of 1.5 meters consisting of gravel, concrete, or other non-combustible material. Fire pits must be a minimum of three meters from all standing trees or vegetation and all overhanging branches must be removed. So the MD does have protocols for, th for, for those things and policies in place and, they, and, and enforcement. So um, that doesn't necessarily stop anyone from having a fire, as you saw from the appellant's pictures, in places that they're not supposed to. Uh, but that wouldn't really be a reason to not build a build a skating rink. Uh, permits to build storage sheds typically do not require a comprehensive fire risk assessment, um, and that's for the reasons I've given. However, the approving authority did not include the follow or sorry did include the following condition in the notice of decision: the developer should consider using fire smart construction materials for the interior for the exterior of the building and in particular should use a roofing material with a class A or B Underwriters Laboratories of Canada ULC fire rating, as you heard from the planner, Brittany. I think we've beaten the wildlife fence to death. Is everyone happy with the, with the wildlife fence? Is there any questions about, about that? My comment on the risk to children in the dark, or our, our comments, um, the, the lighting system that was pr proposed uh, is, is meant to be turned off at 11 to be in keeping with the, with the noise bylaw. It's not about the, the light so much as the noise. If you turn the lights out, it gets quiet quickly after the lights go out. Um, a camera monitoring system is not only impractical, but likely has some privacy issues associated with it. And uh, like all facilities similar in the Bow Valley, when the facility is closed, the lights go off. No incidents of children not being able to walk home safely was encountered in the years that we operated the uh, temporary rink right next to the proposed site. So the next one is on the parking. And I know that Brittany did speak to the fact that parking is not a requirement. Um, but I personally do think that parking can lead to a lot of trouble if it's not uh, properly anticipated. Um, and I didn't have a whole lot of time to make my case, but I, I did provide the, the proposed 16 spaces in uh, Limestone Valley and along that road. But uh, if we could just scroll through uh, on, on Sunday at noon, 
I took a little tour of the community. I stayed away from the um, part of Rivers Bend Close where the appellants live, uh, but just went through Limestone Valley. And uh, um, this is the area that we had identified, both of these photos. And we can just go, If uh, you can just keep going because it's going to take a bit. Um, there was 54 vacant street parking spots on that Sunday at noon. And you can you can take some time to go over these on your on your own on the weekend or whatever. But there was plenty of street parking available on a Sunday. Oh, and um, oh, so we've passed the the other photos. There's a there was a similar number. There's about sixty spots available on a Tuesday at noon, and I th th that was all I could I could really do because it was a weekend and and the hearing was today. So I picked a a weekend day and a working weekday, and they were similar. There was a little bit more parking available during during the uh, the working week, which was surprising. Uh, garbage. The uh, temporary rink site didn't have garbage receptacles. It wasn't a requirement. It was, it was one of those just for now deals that we made with the MD to just get a rink up and running back in 2017. Uh, it was very, very informal and uh, we didn't have garbage receptacles. The access, uh, it, it, just to clarify the, the type of garbage uh, receptacles that we'll have there. <clears throat> They'll be the uh, the single bag receptacles. They will be bear proof bins, just like you see in the parks um, in the MD. There's currently some situated on the on the trail along the backside of the homes, and there's some you know on on cul de sacs, and and they're adding more all the time. But they are not truck access. The MDs uh, bins are are also not truck access. These these have to be removed by hand. Um, and and ours will fall into that it's sort of same same thing. So that you would then access with a half ton truck or something to get in there. Or are you just going to walk them out? You walk it out. So that that uh, the path that you see uh, leading to the rink, there 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 are garbage cans along that back path, and they're not accessed by vehicle. So the MD staff would have to either carry uh, do you carry it out in a wheelbarrow or do you just yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're meant to be carried. So it'll be the same thing. Okay, thank you. Oh. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to address that uh, little hiccup that we had uh, on the 21 day appeal period. You saw some photographs of some equipment going in. Um, it turns out that uh, that was a miscommunication. Um, it, I shouldn't say miscommunication. It wasn't a miscommunication, it was a misunderstanding. Um, so the community association assumed that the advertisement from our notice of decision, which we were very excited about, would have gone out the same week that the decision was made. Uh, it turned out that it was over a week later that it was published, and, and we didn't really read that fine print. We started counting the days immediately after the RMO went out the week of, of our decision. Uh, but we didn't do any work, and we did... Uh, so um, on our committee, we have uh, the person that will be responsible for the earthworks, and he told us at the meeting uh, just ahead of, of the 21 days expiring that he had a couple of guys that could move a truck and a bobcat onto the site on the weekend. And other than that, he would not have time for this because it's, you know, it's volunteer work. Um, so we applied to the MD to get the road use permit, which allows us to put that equipment on the site. Um, and a copy of that is, is on here too. Yeah, right there. So that, that was issued pretty much the same day that we applied. And that entitled us to, to uh, mobilize into the site, even though the, the appeal period, excuse me, hadn't, um, hadn't expired. But we definitely did misunderstand the, the appeal period. I had uh, contacted the development officer and said, 21 days is up, was there any appeals? And she said, I'll check on that. And if there aren't any and we're good, then I'll send you your development permit. And that was late in the week. I don't. I think it might have been a Friday. Um, in, in any event, we didn't get the development permit because we were wrong about the days. And uh, 
uh, we went ahead and, and put that equipment in, but we didn't do any work. So I think like what, what the, the message here is that there was no blatant disregard of MPC rules. Um, we, we definitely um, expected that we were in good to begin, but we were definitely good to mobilize that equipment in. So we didn't break any rules there. I think... The only other thing that was brought up was the um, the drop in value of the houses, and I don't think that I really need to say much about that. Um, I think I could probably find a realtor that would tell me um, that it would improve the value of the house, same way you could find a realtor that would say that it would drop the value of the house, so I'm not sure how much credence I can put into that. Um, the, uh, the only other one, of course, is the flood, issue which I think has been has been dealt with by uh, by Peter so that concludes our presentation thank you mr. chairman um, could you just uh, cl clarify again uh, the situation situation with respect to restrooms uh, <clears throat> will there be restroom facilities on site uh, so not? so so we, um, we were not required by um, the development officer uh, to include restrooms. And that was, you know, a discussion that we had about whether or not that would be something that, uh, that was necessary. We've been operating that rink uh, since 2017, 2016, um, in, in, you know, in just an adjacent to the proposed site. And uh, everybody walks there and, I don't know, they're, there, there hasn't been a need for the for the restrooms, and we anticipate that uh, restrooms would be um, more appropriate when we get more of the recreational development that's anticipated. Uh, the The whole site is expected to contain recreation, sports fields, and so forth, and there's access provi uh, provided to that site. Uh, on a future road allowance that's at the far east end of Limestone Valley. And so when that occurs, there will be parking dedicated to the site. There would be all of the utilities brought in for, for restrooms and so forth. Uh, but we did compare it to other uh, outdoor rinks in the Bow Valley, and most of them don't have uh, restrooms. Okay, yeah, thank you. I, I, I just questioned that because... Um <clears throat> of my age. <laughs> uh, I have a question um, regarding your timeline for developing the rest of the recreational facilities that are on the site, and do you have any idea over what period of time that will happen? We, d we don't have any idea at all. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, at, at this point in time, is there anybody else in the room that would like to speak in support of the proposal? And again, please identify yourself. I guess my name wasn't on the list to present, but uh, my name is Scott Vandermeer. Uh, I just wanted to just clarify one thing. Uh, you've received a timeline with regards to when this whole process started. Um, I should have been included in the notes anyway. So I just wanted to clarify when we were talking about sufficient time to be given to you know, be a part of the process and ask questions and that kind of thing. Uh, you can see on that timeline, I think it was, yeah, so we started the summer, spring of 2019, the Dead Man's Flats Community Association struck the Recreation Committee. Uh, November of 2019, we did a door-to-door -door survey. Uh, spring of 2020, it was identified as a priority and so forth. So, and since then, uh, since 2019, we've had every Dead Man's Flats Community Association meeting. We've there's usually the rec committee in the notes, and we try to give an update. So, just uh, to validate that part. Thank you. That's all you have. That's all. Yeah. All right. Anybody else?
Hey, uh, Mr. Secretary, has there been any correspondence received in support of the MPC decision? There, yes, there has. You have it in your package. Um, there are a number of submissions uh, that was pointed out by uh, Mr. Long. That is the survey that was done this, uh, asking for people to sign off on a standard uh, form. They did that plus into the comments. I've got emails in here. Um, that's all included in your package. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the appellants now have an opportunity to have any rebuttals that they wish to present. Still on? Yeah. Um, I know they've said it isn't a wildlife corridor, but the wildlife do go through there. And I feel it's important in the Vaux Valley that we do respect our wildlife because you'll only notice, and this is for somebody that's outside of Canada, you'll only notice they're not, you, they, they won't be there. And that's the only time you'll notice that they're actually missing. And there needs to be some space given to the wildlife in Dead Man's Flats. And Karen's an expert tracker, so she, she can see the tracks of the bears going through in the mud. And there are also the odd cougar goes through as well. That we do know that there is wildlife in that area. I know they've got a lot of submissions from people in Dead Man's Flats in support of it. Well, I went to the Copperstone, which is just up from where the playground area is designated, and I asked, could I get in touch with the, the, you know, the owners' association? And the flat point refused. They said I had to go through the MD. And um, there's also the Sparrowhawk development, which is another what sixty houses is it? Sixty. And then there's the cliff, which is only recently, which is again on that side of just ne next to the Husky Garage. That's three developments with lots of people, and if they were consulted, and I don't know whether the Dead Man's Facts Community Association did any consultation there, but there's a huge number of people there who'd maybe appreciate a rink in the designated playground area. I mean, it is a consideration that should be taken in. You know, it's, I know that people who are living in Dead Man's Flats in the south side of the Pigeon Creek might say, yes, this is where we want it. But there are people in the north side of Pigeon Creek, sorry, the south side, I've mixed them up, but there are on the other side of Pigeon Creek who would like perhaps to have the rink in that particular area. And I'm really amazed and an experienced person that like Shane Jonker doesn't know the rules regarding when and when you can't do a development. I really do find that hard to believe with all the experience you've had in dealing with the MD. There are, in answer to your question, there are restrooms down in the playground area which could be used if the rink was placed in that area, which is already designated. You could only have to walk across the fence into the, is it the Bow Valley Campground? Yeah, the Bow Valley Campground, you would find restrooms there. Um, the pathway, I'm still, I just don't agree with your fire chief's recommendation. What he needs to do is get in there with a fire truck and do a, just get a kid on fire investigation, just to say, right, there's a, there's a kid on fire in Dead Man's Flats where they're going to plant this rink. See how much of your vehicles can get down that, and then add in, by the way, it's covered with snow and ice, and are you going to slide into the storm pit? I mean, that's what really needs to be done. And as we know here, it's not the fire department of Exshaw that responds, it's the fire department in Canmore. And I can assure you, I looked at one of their trucks today, and there's no way it's going down that path. No way. That concludes my rebuttal. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to ask now the appellants if they feel they've had a fair and impartial hearing. Thank you. Uh, the board will render its decision within 15 days. The public hearing, public aspect of this hearing is now concluded. The board will go in camera to render its decision. Thank you all for your attendance.